Um, thank you for turning up. We realise you're all busy people. Um, and to make this time, uh, we're very pleased that you have made this time to come and talk about this. Um, for those that don't know, um, I'm Stuart Peter for the time being, um, Director of Environmental Health. Um, my background is in housing and environmental health uh, in a slightly larger island further north, but don't hold that against me. Um, what we're here to talk about today is the new law, uh, Public Health and a ridiculously long title which wasn't of my making. Um, it's one that we sort of inherited and tweaked a bit. Um, this law was passed by the previous assembly and then got caught up in the general election. Um, our minister was keen to get it through before the general election, but other people had more pressing priorities, so it was delayed. So again, it went back to uh, the new assembly with um, a lot of new people in there, and it was again passed both times unanimously. So if you don't like it politically, please speak to your representative, um, and you can always check to see which way they voted. Um, so it was adopted by the states in December last year. Um, after quite severe scrutiny on two occasions, and then it went to Privy Council on the 14th of March, uh, registered by the Royal Court on the 23rd of March, and then we had the hiatus that was the general election, which produced a different set of uh, representatives, and the Appointed Day Act was passed unanimously and came into force on the 1st of October. Um, it's been a long way, a long route. Some of you will remember previous attempts on previous laws written by previous people, um, which were frankly not well written, not well presented, and probably deserved the fate that they got. Um, Why well, was it brought forward? In brief, uh, to allow the state to ensure housing provided through the rental market was safe for tenants and visitors and unlikely to cause ill health. It's about 101 years after similar legislation has come through around the world, and hopefully we've learned from their mistakes. Uh, we're told frequently that there's no bad housing in Jersey. Um, we see it every week. Um, some appalling. We still see places without toilets. We still see things that are frankly not fit to live in. There is, of course, every chance that I'm speaking here to the converted, the professional, the conscientious, and it almost begs the question, why are we bothering? Well, we're bothering because if you people understand what's happening as the good land laws, it allows us to concentrate on those few, we don't know how many, uh, and the, the properties that we need to bring up to standard. I can honestly say if you're a good, conscientious landlord with one, 101, 1,001 properties, you've got nothing to worry about the new law. So, I need to say it's not a panacea. Um, Any time you mention housing in the States, or in general, we get told there's no, not enough housing supply. I agree, but that's not an environmental health issue, that's an issue for the housing minister, for the politicians. You then mention housing supply, we get into the whole debate about population control and everything else. That's not for us. Our role is to make sure that the places that are available through whatever route are safe for tenants um, and not going to cause them in health. We already have quite a lot. We've got tenancy protection, which the Minister for Housing has now delegated enforcement to the Environment Health Team because they're actually out visiting properties and those things crop up. Um, fire safety, um, we have colleagues here yet again from the um, Jersey Fire and Rescue. They will deal with the more complicated aspects, we will deal with the simpler aspects, and happily we get to say what's simpler, so if we can't hack it, we'll pass it on up the hill. Um, and we've worked well with them over the years with very limited legislation. <coughs> the deposit scheme, which I know some of you have come to, uh, come to love, um, again, we will investigate that. We have access to the database, so we can very quickly check to see if somebody's deposit has been put in there. We often come across tenants who aren't quite sure, uh, and we can reassure them that yes, it was put in there. Um, so we come to uh, supply of services. Um, we still come across people who are being overcharged for the electricity. Uh, that law's been in since 2013. We ought to be able to have worked that one out by now. And again, we will deal with that because those things have been passed to us. So we come now to the minimum standards. Uh, it's yet another piece in the jigsaw. As I say, there are more that may, be, may, may come, may not. That's for the politicians, how they will deal with supply, 
how they will deal with the rent cuts, why they would want to. That's not for us. We're here to talk about minimum standards. So, what we're looking for, the law allows for the introduction of minimum standards for all tenants of rented dwellings through hazards and harm outcomes. Now, I know that people here from Andium, they address this with the decent homes. The first line of the decent home standard actually said there'll be no category one hazards. They've been doing that. What this does is it brings all rented dwellings onto the level playing field. We keep getting told if you want a level playing field, well, here it is. Um, the level playing field. It's an evidence-based methodology already adopted in the decent home standards. Essentially, what we're saying is that your property that you are renting will not cause you ill health or harm. It's not rocket science, it's nothing that anybody need worry about. Most homes on the island will already be there. Just like most people don't speed, most people don't go above 40 along there, but we have a law to catch those that go at 70 or 80 or 100 miles an hour. This still says draft on it. Um, the law drafters are working today on the last little tweak, uh, which we'll get to. We're expecting it to be with us end of this week, the end of next week, and then the minister will sign that. And the intention is that they won't become uh, part of the law until December. And even from then on, we've got a lot of wiggle room because that's the way we work. Um, there are four things that I'd really like everybody who rents out property to look at. These are the proactive things. Smoke alarms in all rented properties will become part of the law. But why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to protect your own asset by having a smoke alarm in there? Now, my smoke alarm at home is hardwired because that coincided with me having other work done, um, which is great. Um, whether you do that or not, to some extent, depends on the property, but a standard property, battery is fine. And because we know that tenants will take the battery out to power something else, we're not expecting for you to make sure it's working all the time. We're expecting you to make sure it's working when the person moves in there. Clearly, if it's hardwired, or if you're doing an inspection, you can check that. We cannot legislate against people being stupid. We cannot legislate against people deciding not to protect themselves. It can never be a landlord's problem if the tenant takes the battery out. Of course it can't. Carbon monoxide detectors. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a growing problem. Um, more people actually die as a percentage from carbon monoxide from solid fuel, from um, log burning stoves, from burning coal, than they do from gas. Um, but Again, if you're building a new property with a new gas, fire, gas boiler, or if you're putting one in, building regulations insist that you have a carbon monoxide detector. What we're saying is, if your tenant is burning or can burn solid fuel, uh, there should be a carbon monoxide detector. Our team now goes out with them where we have problems, where we have suspicions, and there have been three or four properties so far already this year where we were concerned, we lent them one and they actually sounded overnight. Um, which is worrying. Carbon monoxide is the silent killer. It, uh, it's becoming prevalent in the trendy world of cooking to cook on charcoal, um, which is fine as long as it's ventilated, but when they lock the door, switch the ventilation off. If that charcoal is still warm, it can continue um, to make carbon monoxide, which if there are flats above, can be lethal. So again, I could do that again. Again, you cannot legislate against people being stupid. One of the person that was woken up by our alarm going off um, actually took the batteries out to stop it going off and went back to sleep. Crazy. The other people evacuated. So we need to be careful about that. If you've got a gas supply where the gas pipes are still pressured, whether or not you have um, any gas appliances in there, you need to get the gas supply checked because it can still leak, it can still the explosive, you can still cause problems. It's a very simple check, it's a drop check. And the last one is periodic ele electrical safety checks. You might see debate going on about that in, in the UK. Um, we're not asking for that to come in straight away because we know both electricians on the island are really busy. Um, five years to bring that in is fairly reasonable. It's not onerous, it's what we do in our own property. And again, we're not saying that if there's damage to a socket, that that's your responsibility. It might be your responsibility to sort out, because the tenant's caused it, clearly. Your lease will make sure that the tenant pays for it. So, how are we going to regulate? Well, what I want to do is to tell you that we do light-touch regulation. 
We want to work with all landlords, if necessary, to bring about incremental improvement for the less good rent of stock. The only time that we would be a bit harsh is if there's imminent risk. If we think somebody is about to die or a risk of serious injury, of course we will act. We would have acted before this law, we will act after this law. I can think of only maybe two occasions in the last six and a half years where that's happened. Um, what we want to do is to agree a course of action if there is a problem with a property. And most people won't have any problems with any properties. That's what we believe, that's what we hope. But strangely enough, I don't get many people ringing up and saying, you know, Stuart, my landlord's brilliant and you should see how good my property is. We do get one or two people saying otherwise. And do we always believe them? No, of course we don't. Because we know that they might have had a dispute, they might not want to tell you something, they might be behind in the rent. We understand what goes happening there. We are legally obliged to investigate, but we investigate with an open mind. If there is something wrong, we think most properties it will be minor, and we want to work with landlords to their convenience and for the tenants' convenience to get that sorted out. What we are not going to be is an eviction team. Only if we fail on a degree of course, uh, an agreed course of action will notices become involved. And again, those notices can be appealed. It's not a, an offence. It only becomes an offence if there's a breach of a notice, and that again can be appealed. We've served perhaps five notices under different legislation this year. We could have served, if we were in the UK, probably 20 or 30 times that number. But because it's Jersey, because of the way we work, because of the community we are, we can do it differently, and we will do it differently. We want to work with you guys, with the good landlords, to make sure properties are safe. And the Minister actually said that in the States when they, when they were debating the Appointed Day Act. He talked about the sort of regulation and the way he wants it to, do, to go on, which is the way we have gone on. The provisions of the law are written to allow nuanced enforcement. I mean, this is a bit of a simplistic example, but if we found somewhere that was actually heavily overcrowded, but the tenants were all happy, there wasn't anything else wrong with the place, the tenants didn't want to move, the landlord was, was happy, why would we need to do something? Well, in time, we need to make sure that that overcrowding goes away, but the law would allow us to serve notice saying, it's overcrowded, we want to stop this at the change of tenancy. So nothing changes, nothing affects the landlord or the tenant until there's a change of tenancy. Perhaps a better example was one from, from Newcastle, where there was an extension which was so narrow that it had the kitchen in it and you couldn't actually stand in front of the kitchen door and open it. But the tenant was loving a house, she had the little doilies around the place, the pictures of the grandchildren, it wasn't inherently unsafe for her, she didn't want it changing, so we were able to say to the landlord, when this tenant leaves you need to do these works. He was happy, she was happy because it protected her tenancy and we'd done the job for everybody else. We're there to protect tenancies, we're there to protect the tenant, we're also there to help the landlord. Um, you'll notice at the back there's a supply of leaflets about dampness. We've given away probably 7,000 or so, so far. Please help yourself, we can print more, we have more. If you want a large supply of them for all your tenants, please tell us, we'll get them to you. It's important that people understand that tenants have responsibilities as well as rights, and landlords have rights as well as responsibilities. So we're there when necessary to protect that, and if you ask us out to your, visit your property, or the tenant does, and we think it's the way somebody's living in there, we will say so, we will put it in writing, and we will stand by it. And in the past, such reports have been used in courts of law where necessary. We understand that if somebody battens down the hatches, cranks up the heating, and then proceeds to dry nappies on radiators, we're going to get compensation and more growth. That cannot be at the door of the landlord, that is the, the door of the tenant. What we need to do is to work with that tenant through education, through leaflets, to remove the mould and make sure it doesn't recur. We understand the way that works. We also have problems with people not understanding storage heating, whether it's a language issue or whether they're just so excited when they move into their new property they don't understand it. And we'll get cold, told it's cold, whatever. By the time we've explained how the heating works, and they've used it for a while. First of all, they're paying less in electricity, and secondly, the heating's working. We do have access to those. Uh, I believe there's quite a lot on the JEC website as well. And we have uh, some 
Polish and Portuguese condensation leaflets that we use. We're hoping in time to get our own revised and also translated into the, uh, the most popular languages to help you. Sometimes it helps if you can give a leaflet that says Stakes of Jersey on it rather than the landlord, because landlords would say that, wouldn't they? And we're happy to do that, and if there are other things that you think we need to do, please tell us. Um, so, we come to the standards. Now, for the first time, the housing standards are based on the occupant, not on the property. So, it's not the defect that interests us, it's not the slip tile, it's not the crack window, it's the effect of the defect. So, in the past, we might have been upset if there was a slip tile, but if that slip tile isn't causing anybody any problem, where's the problem? That's a property thing, that's, that comes from his, historically where we're also involved with building control. Um, what we're interested in is if there's a slip tile or not, but there's water getting in, that water's causing dampness, it's stripping off electric, electrical surfaces, then there's a, an implication for the health. That's when we would want to be interested. So what we would tell you in the first instance was, we're fine, you might want to look at that slip tile when you're doing routine maintenance or not, so effectively we're telling you what we've spotted for your use should you choose to. Um, to take us up on it. In the second case, we'd say we need to do this because it's causing this, this health, effect, health effect. So it's the effect of the defects that we're looking at. We inspect properties, frankly, in exactly the same way we always have. Um, it's a property. Some start at the bottom and work up, some at the top and work out. So, where did these hazards come from? They're evidence based. Um, it's based on work in the UK where they checked every um, entry into every single A&E, every doctor GP where somebody came in with illness or damage that was caused <coughs> in the home over five years and they had the first 30 ways that you're most likely to die or be uh, injured and they lost the 30th, the 30th was drowning. So be aware that that will be covered in the generality of it um, if you're renting out properties with swimming pools just you know, make sure your tenants don't drown them please. Um, but these are the most obvious ones. Damp and mould growth, and it affects for usually people that are 14 years old or younger. Uh, the survey of the schools that the Children's Commissioner did that was published recently, 7% of children reported living in properties where their bedroom has black mould. Now, we're not saying that's rented properties, that question wasn't asked. But whether it's rented, owner-occupied or whatever, um, that is a lot of children. And a small patch of dark mould in the bedroom is going to cause far more problems than a really nasty black mouldy bathroom. Because you're not in there for long if you're in the shower, it's taking the spores away. It's a lot more of a health risk having a small patch near the cot head where the baby might be there for hours. So we need to deal with that. Excess cold, excess heat. Was it two years ago in Paris that we lost 80 people with excess heat? These were really highly glazed buildings with no ventilation and they're the same places that would cause excess cold. And you can see them there and who's, and who's affected. So radiation, that's interesting. Are we going to ask you all to rush out and do radium check, radiation checks? No, we're not. Of course we're not. You cannot do a check for radon unless you have the cooperation of the tenant. Um, I know Andy and I just managed to do most of their houses and they must have some corporate tenants. When we tried to do it for free, um, people suggested that they didn't want it. Not always politely. Um, so if your tenant asks for it because they're particularly worried, we'd expect for you to say, yeah, okay, it's 50 quid or whatever, but you need to keep this in your house for three months. Don't feed it to the dog, don't throw it in the bin, whatever. If your tenant's not that interested, we're not going to get upset about it. That's probably one of our least worries in terms of, of tenancies. Tenancies tend not to be in, in the main for a long time, so it's a lifetime exposure that's the problem there. Entry by int intruders. Well, it's not actually the entry by intruders that, people are, that concerns people. It's the fear of entry by intruders. Um, crime levels on Jersey are very low compared with elsewhere, um, but for the sake of the chain on the door or a people, if you've got that sort of door, it will certainly help. We're not going to demand that, it's just good practice. There have been a lot of studies about how you can help uh, reduce the likelihood of, of breaking by not having high hedges in front of bay windows and things where people can stand behind and pry up the windows and then stash the TV or whatever. 
Um, the important things, personal hygiene, sanitation, drainage. Yes, we want to have somewhere to wash. Yes, it'd be really great if we had a WC. Um, and most places have, most, most places are fine. The things that affect the over 60s most, and I am one, um, falls in the bath. Again, all we would ex ask is that a normal person of that age can get in and out of the bath. Not anybody with any special needs, not anybody that needs special <coughs> aids. That's a job for the occupational <coughs> therapist, it's not a job for us. We're talking about the average person here. Um, falls on the level, we're not talking about a little trip hazard. We're talking about those that are likely to get us all. Maybe the one and a half inch lip that isn't properly marked or something in the middle of a floor, across the floor that's going to get me. Um, falls associated with stairs and steps. If, I can't say elderly lady anymore, <laughs> if a lady of a certain age falls down the stairs, and it tends to be ladies, and breaks their hip, that's going to cost the states over 100,000 in the first year, as well as the misery and what it's going to cost the patient. And it could be that all we need to help prevent that is a stair rail, a handrail. Um, under the old legislation in the UK, you couldn't ask for one to be fitted, but you could be asked for a defective one to be replaced. It seems a little bonkers. Um, fire tends to kill people 60 years now. Look, I wouldn't recommend not getting out because you're younger than that. <laughs> uh, and explosions. We had a tragedy of the explosion earlier this year. I'm not sure if it was ever actually specified what it was, but again, the annual safety checks may help that. Some landlords have said, you know what, I'm just going to take gas out. That's fine by us, as long as the replacement heating system is good. That's a management decision, that's a strategy decision for the landlord. Um, and clearly, if you've got structurally, structural collapse, that's going to hit whoever it hits. So, there are seven houses where children are most vulnerable. One of them being electrocution, because little fingers find their way into, uh, into <coughs> sockets. Nine where the elderly are most vulnerable, and 13 where it's going to get us all. <coughs> Our actions are always based on persuasive compliance. Light touch, education, information, working with you. We're not going to come in steaming um, and throwing notices around. Light touch enforcement, if necessary, and only where actually the last resort would we or could we take legal action. We need the Minister's sanction for that. It's not just something we're going to come steaming in with.